Welcome to BrainFluence. I'm Roger Dooley. I'm delighted to welcome a fellow McGraw-Hill author to the show. Kevin Oakes is the CEO and co-founder of I4CP, a top research firm that discovers the people practices of high-performance organizations. Previously, Kevin was CEO of the first company created by Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, as well as president of SumTotal Systems, one of the world's largest providers of talented learning solutions. His new book is Cultural Renovation, 18 Leadership Actions to Build an Unshakable Company. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Hey, thanks for having me, Roger. Glad to be here. So, uh, Kevin, you were in the online learning space uh, way before it was cool. Uh, last year, suddenly, it seems like all learning went online. Uh, you know, has this changed the tools and the methods in a big way? Or, you know, how, how would you, what do you see the this, this state of the art in that space? Yeah, it's funny you bring, you bring that up. I was just talking about this with somebody else. Uh, yeah, I got into online learning back before, the, well before the CD-ROM was even invented, Roger, and uh, before we were using the internet. So we were doing uh, e-learning uh, back then through other methods. Uh, but so it's been fun to see the whole online learning community uh, blossom over that time, but it has really blossomed during the pandemic. And one of the biggest changes I've seen, I've always been a big advocate of user-generated content within corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, and for whatever reason, uh, companies haven't adopted that as widely as I expected. And I've been talking about it for close to 20 years until now. And so now you're seeing companies really adopt uh, that, that user-generated format uh, and allowing employees to create their own online learning inside of organizations. But certainly as a whole, online learning um, has blossomed during the pandemic for obvious reasons. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's good to see. It's, um, it's an area of, uh, you know, of this space that I devoted a lot of my life to. And uh, I've got a lot of friends in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I4CP, Kevin, is billed as a research company. And in practical terms, what does that mean? We're doing more HR research than anyone on the planet. And all of our research is focused on the people practices within organizations that correlate to bottom line business impact. And we call that high performance. And so in every research study we do, we look at what are high performing organizations as measured by revenue growth, profitability, market share, what are they doing differently with their people versus low performing organizations? And there's almost always a market difference uh, when we uh, do that bifurcation. Uh, when we look at high performance organizations, what my team really focuses on are not only best practices across those companies, uh, but we try to uncover next practices. And next practices is a term we use a lot inside my organization. It refers to specific practices where we can see it makes a real impact inside the organization, but not a lot of companies have widely adopted it across the board. And so we flag that for our membership as a practice to keep your eye out for, to learn more about, uh, and really try to highlight those companies that are implementing that next practices, next practice. So across the board, Roger, we're just looking at all aspects of HR or human capital. Mm -hmm. So what are you finding uh, lately? What, what are some of the really uh, key exciting differences that you've discovered? You know, what's, what's been very interesting during the pandemic is that HR is front and center in most organizations. And it's been said by several that back in the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, a great CFO really could make the difference between whether a company survived that or not. Today, it's uh, all focused on a great CHRO or head of HR. Mm -hmm. And that head of HR position has really been thrust into the limelight. And more and more organizations are recognizing how strategic uh, the HR function is inside their company. Uh, and so from a, uh, you know, from a perspective of looking at what's new and exciting and different, what's most exciting to me is that strategic alignment um, by the HR function. But also, uh, I think companies have become much more empathetic during the pandemic than they were before. I've heard this from many employees that they have seen their leadership in a different light. In many ways, they've been uh, introduced into the personal lives of their leaders, but also of their coworkers, right? And we're jettisoned into people's houses every day through Zoom and uh, you know, Teams and other channels. Uh, and so we now, you know, know what their living room or, you know, their kitchen looks like and, you know, see the kids. What kind the of dog they have. <laughs> yeah, what kind of pets they have. And 
uh, you know, it's given people a new appreciation for their coworkers. Uh, there's, you know, there's no such thing anymore as a business persona and, you know, just your overall persona. Now, you know, everybody's seeing the whole person these days. And I've heard from many that it's giving them, uh, you know, a different perspective in general. And I think that's positive. I, I hope that continues uh, after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've observed in a different way, obviously, than you, but uh, uh, some of that uh, changed thinking. And some companies were very people-oriented all along, and I think they were able to deal with pandemic issues more readily than those companies that were not particularly people-oriented. And, you know, one company that comes to mind as um, being a little bit of a sort of bifurcation, you know, Amazon has always been very customer focused. And this is a big reason for their success. I mean, as a customer, I absolutely love their service. Uh, and they are good to their employees. They've got great education benefits and typically pay above average and you know, a bunch of other good stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not sure that they had that uh, uh, emp uh, empathy connection of, you know, for their people. Uh, and that uh, the, the people, particularly those who aren't maybe in management or in some key technical position, but the folks in the warehouses and driving the trucks and such were more or less uh, little cogs in the machine. And uh, I think with the pandemic, suddenly they, well, obviously they had to increase uh, the number there. They had to keep people at work. And uh, you were seeing a few sort of um, cracks in the wall where, gee, uh, these People are people, and they are not necessarily responding like little cogs. Uh, so we've had some walkouts and such. And uh, what what are how do you think? Are they adapting to this uh, well? Do you think? Yeah, I, um, as we talk right now, I'm literally two miles away from Amazon's headquarters, and I have a lot of respect for that company. We do a lot of work with Amazon, and uh, I work with a lot of the HR leadership there. Uh, I actually, even know uh, Jeff Bezos a little bit, and he's. He's a great guy um, uh, and I think just has a lot of um, compassion for, uh, for people and um, you know, certainly for the business, business and businesses that they're in. But I marvel at Amazon because they have, they have issues that most companies don't have. Uh, and so I think sometimes when you know, we read about you know, some of these issues, you gotta cut them a little bit of slack. They have grown at a scale that we've never seen before, right, in business. And they're now at a scale from a number of employee perspective that uh, only a handful of companies even come close to. Uh, and so the, the issues that I think they have to wrestle with on a, on a global basis are far different than what most executives, what most companies uh, have to wrestle with. And I commend them for how well they have grown and scaled the organization uh, and, uh, you know, and, and really uh, continued with just fantastic customer service throughout. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I do think that the pandemic has introduced, obviously, new challenges that the company has met quite well. Um, but it's a it's a company that's complex and uh, one that I think is, you know, a lot of organizations will emulate over time uh, because of what they've accomplished and, and really, you know, sort of being a pioneer in what they've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't imagine uh, any other scale up on the scale and speed of Amazon's other than something like mobilizing troops for World War II. I mean, where you're suddenly pushing hundreds of thousands of people into roles that they weren't uh, doing the week before. Agreed. And uh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's it's pretty phenomenal what what they've done. And uh, I, I agree, they're a super impressive company. I use them a lot in many of my presentations and in my own book, Friction, they are front and center as friction reducers uh, through customer experience and <laughs> other ways too. Uh, yep. So, uh, Kevin, your new book is about culture renovation. How do you define culture? You know, it's funny. I um, might be the first author on a book on culture that didn't define culture in, in the book itself. And I, I did we that. Leave on your options open. That's what I say. <laughs> I, um, I did that on purpose, Roger, because I, I really felt like a lot of people understand culture and a lot of the definitions I see of culture um, you know, get very fluffy, uh, very ethereal. Uh, you know, there are some definitions that we've used internally and my, my co-founder, Jay Jamrog, and I have, have always, um, you know, liked, liked definitions that are simple around culture, such as culture is what happens when no one is looking, uh, I think is, is a good one. But it's really about what is rewarded, what's condoned, what's penalized inside of an organization. And it's the, the norms of, of the organization itself. 
But culture today has taken on, I think, even new importance than it has in the past. Uh, there's no question in my mind, it's inextricably linked to financial performance. And research bears this out, our research and many others, that uh, if you have a healthy culture as an organization, generally solid financial performance follows. It's not the reverse, you know, it's not, this isn't a chicken or the egg kind of thing that, you know, once you have financial success, mm -hmm. suddenly you have a great culture. It's not to say that that doesn't happen once in a while, but mostly what happens is organizations create a great culture and then have tremendous financial success. Well, well and, okay, uh, Kevin, how, how do you uh, determine that? In other words, if you're plotting a, a culture against performance, uh, how do you determine where somebody is on the uh, culture scale? Like how, you know, how do you assign this company has a good culture, this company has a great culture, this company's culture isn't very good. It's, it's actually relatively easy. And uh, you do that through culture assessments. Uh, you know, there's, a, you know, there's a variety of different ways to assess culture. And then you also measure culture and there's a variety of different ways to measure culture. But most companies are uh, assessing their own culture and beginning to measure uh, their culture and their progress in their cultures. Uh, a lot of times because the board of directors is asking for this now and they've gotten a lot of advice from the NACD mm -hmm. and even the SEC have, uh, has put in new regulations for public companies where they're looking for more human capital disclosures around organizations. And so boards are looking for more metrics around culture. But I, I point to Roger, just some great case studies, uh, which the book out, outlines for sure. To me, one of the best is Microsoft, uh, another Northwest company. Uh, you could very, very clearly see that when Satya Nadella came in as CEO and new leadership that surrounded him, uh, the very first thing that Satya said in his uh, first shareholder meeting was, culture is going to be the biggest predictor of our financial performance. And he and his CHRO, Kathleen Hogan and Joe Whittinghill and a few others set out to make some pretty uh, marked differences in the culture. Um, at the time when Satya became CEO, there was a lot of concern around Microsoft. People were liking it to Sears and, and that Microsoft had lost its mojo and you know, was uh, not gonna be an innovator uh, going forward. Well, you know, fast forward, not, not too many years, you know, just three to five years, and Satya turned Microsoft into the most valuable company in the world. And today, I think it's number two behind Apple. They kind of go back and forth. And I, again, I live very close to the campus. Uh, I can see it on an everyday basis. Uh, years ago, when I used to talk to people there, uh, you know, there was a lot of infighting, there was a lot of complaining. Today, there's a lot of just vision for the future, hope for the future. Uh, you know, the attitude has really turned around inside the organization. And it's around some of the basic things that they put in place around their culture change. And, and I uh, document some of that in the book. So what would an example be of a cultural change within Microsoft? I think one of the biggest ones was around the concept of growth mindset, which they've gotten a lot of uh, press around and accolades around. Previously at Microsoft, uh, intellect and knowledge were very valued, overvalued inside the company. And there was a theme of knowledge is power. If I possessed core unique knowledge, I was very powerful. And typically people use that um, to wield their power. Today, um, it's all about knowledge sharing is power. And uh, I really credit Satya for this. He talks a lot about, I don't want a company of know-it-alls. I want a company of learn-it-alls. And that's what growth mindset um, at its heart is really about. It's about the concept that you can develop uh, as a person, uh, you can change as a person, uh, your capabilities and abilities are not just uh, innate, uh, they can be learned over time. And when you adopt that mindset, it kind of changes your whole outlook on things. And that has really made a big difference at Microsoft. I'll give you one other example. They, um, they also used to have a performance management process uh, that was called forced ranking or forced distribution, which uh, numbered people in every division department, you know, one through however many, you know, let's, let's say it's one through 10, if you had 10 people in the group. So there was always somebody at the bottom and they, they often used that system to thin, you know, the bottom to take out some of those low performers. But if you think about what that uh, incense, the kind of behavior that incense in, in, internally, uh, if you and I were coworkers, Roger, my goal would be to beat you and your goal would be to beat me. 
versus the two of us teaming up to go beat the competition, you know, Apple and Google. And so they got rid of that uh, right around the same time Satya came in as CEO. And today, uh, you know, don't have any semblance of that kind of performance management. It's really on the merits of the, of the individual, but there's much more teamwork happening overall inside the company. And that's been a big part of their, their progress as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, even GE found that, and Jack Welch, I think, finally admitted that the old uh, uh, forced ranking, rank and yank, uh, whatever you want to call it, differentiation, uh, really was not always a good thing. Uh, and just from what I've seen, uh, if you go into a company where there's been no performance management at all, and there's a lot of uh, dead wood and people are just sort of hanging around, uh, you know, that might be good for a year or two, but eventually... <laughs> After you, there you get rid of the legitimate bottom ten percent uh, who probably should not have been there in the first place. Uh, you know, then then it really becomes a negative thing and not a positive thing. And questionable, even if it was a positive thing to begin with. You know, now Microsoft is an example where the CEO said, "Okay, we're going to change our culture." What happens? What you know can. A, an organization do this more from the bottom up or from, you know, within a unit within an organization where, uh, you know, the CEO isn't on board, you know, or is, does it really just have to start at the top every time? Uh, let me put it this way. It can happen grassroots, but it's very rare <laughs> that that uh, happens and actually works. Um, almost all the time, and our research shows this, it has to emanate top down and the CEO has to be on board and the senior team has to be on board uh, with the culture change efforts. Otherwise, it's, it's unlikely um, that there's going to be a whole lot of progress. However, it's not just a, uh, you know, a CEO or, or a senior team only activity. One of the, um, one of the steps that we talk about, and I, I should back up, our, the book is all about a blueprint of how you change culture. And it's based on the research that we've done as well as the case studies. And so we came up with uh, 18 steps that you mentioned at the beginning, Roger. Uh, and we divvied those up under the renovation theme into three phases. And it's plan, build, and maintain. And so one of the early steps um, is to make sure you have a co-creation mindset inside the organization. And what that means is you need to enlist a number of people inside the organization uh, to be on board with the culture change you want to see and be advocates for that culture change. And so we, uh, we talked a lot about the concept of identifying influencers and energizers in the organization because ultimately they're going to be your culture ambassadors. And we identify those people through a process called organizational network analysis. And this is a, um, a science that Rob Cross out of Babson College really is the father of and champion of. Uh, and it, it's, the, um, it, it's all about trying to understand who does the workflow uh, go through inside an organization and who are the true influencers and energizers in the company. Because if you ask senior management who those are, they will generally get it wrong. Uh, a lot of times the, the biggest influencers are way down the hierarchy. Um, they might be introverts, uh, not extroverts. So it's not, they're not so easily identified. And until you use uh, you know, a process of identifying them, you're not going to necessarily get all the right people. But you, you've uh, encountered a lot of these people, Roger, in your day. You, you talk to somebody um, and you come away from a conversation just energized and excited and you know, enthusiastic. And then there's other people you talk to who suck the life out of you, right? They just, <laughs> you know, you're, they're Darth Vader, right? You just uh, come away very unenthused. And so the idea is to make sure you identify those right people to put on what Microsoft called a culture cabinet. You know, these are the uh, culture ambassadors that you want to enlist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd add that uh, co-creation uh, is also a key part of Robert Cialdini's seventh principle, unity, which uh, he talks about influence more in from a, a persuasion standpoint or influencing others uh, to behave in a different way. And after 30 years of having six principles, he introduced number seven, unity. And one way to achieve that unity is co-creation. If somebody participates in creating your thing, uh, they are much more likely to respect and use your thing uh, than if they didn't. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that really syncs up nicely. 
I talk a little bit about agility. Uh, you mentioned that in the book, and you know everybody wants agility. Uh, people talk about agile this, agile that, but uh, <laughs> explain what it means in your context, Kevin. Well, it's uh, you know certainly this year we've uh, witnessed how critical and important having organizational agility is overall. We um, we have done a bunch of research on how receptive to change organizations are. And it's very clear that if you have an organization where the workforce uh, resists change, doesn't like change, uh, you know, looks at it as being an inconvenience, you're generally going to be working in a low performance organization. High performance organizations, they not only accept change um, and, and are used to it, but they look at it as an opportunity. Uh, they look at change that happens in the environment, in their industries. Uh, as a way for them to be better and, uh, and be more competitive long-term. And there's something to um, even inducing change in organizations. And I talk about that in the book. Uh, there's evidence that the companies that sort of constantly shake things up and are, you know, are always um, introducing different changes to the organization, they tend to be the ones that are more agile and ready for when something like a pandemic comes along that they never planned for or expected or experienced before. And so agility, I think, is a key um, aspect of a company being a high performance organization and, and being effective. And there's a number of things you can do to, I think, get the workforce ready uh, to be agile long term. And we've also published um, traits for leaders. Uh, if you want to have agile, an agile workforce, you have to have agile leaders. And agile leaders um, are doing a number of things a little bit differently than leadership in the past and you know, exacting different behaviors. And I think that's where you start if you wanna have an agile workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I've always wanted to do, Kevin, is bring uh, a couple of guests on the show with maybe slightly differing opinions. And uh, you may have run across uh, Safi Bacall's book, Loon Shots, uh, and why big companies tend not to innovate. And uh, he took the phrase that I'm sure you've heard, I've attributed to Peter Drucker about uh, culture eating strategy for breakfast and uh, uh, changed that into uh, the structure eating culture for lunch. Now, uh, it's kind of a false dichotomy, I think. His point is uh, that uh, often it is not culture that is the key determinant, it is uh, the structure. If people's biggest rewards, getting promoted, getting raises, uh, come from helping their boss meet their boss's goals, uh, then pretty much you get people who are good at execution, uh, at uh, optimizing, but you don't get people taking big risks. You don't say, okay, we're, we're going to stick our neck out on this thing because uh, generally the benefits from doing so, if you're successful, you, yeah, you probably get an attaboy, maybe a promotion. Uh, the negative, uh, if you fail, is that you may uh, end up uh, getting uh, on somebody's list and not get promoted or even be out of the company. And uh, that's not true in small organizations because in a, in a startup, uh, nobody's thinking about getting promoted. They're thinking about uh, capturing market share, about uh, being successful. But as big companies age, uh, those, uh, the structure changes. Now, I don't think uh, there's a true dichotomy, though, because the example that you gave, Kevin, of Microsoft, uh, they changed their structure when they revised their uh, or got rid of their ranking program for employees. And uh, uh, you mentioned uh, a little bit earlier uh, that, you know, what gets rewarded uh, is part of culture. And again, that's not just culture, that's structure, too. So I'm just uh, curious what, what your take on that is. How, uh, how important is structure and what kind of structural changes do you see as being important to achieve the right culture? Yeah, there's no question that uh, structure and culture are linked, but I would argue that culture uh, will be the overriding factor. And let me, I'll give you examples of that. You've, you've experienced companies, Roger, where um, mistakes are just punished inside the organization. Mm -hmm. And so everybody, there's no psychological safety, right? Everybody has a fear of failure. And as a result, innovation isn't happening. That is much more a factor of the culture inside the organization than it is the structure in the organization. Mm -hmm. I could have two organizations structured, you know, exactly the same, but I'll tell you that the, uh, the culture that has psychological safety is the one that's going to prevail and the company that's going to succeed. 
I do think that um, there's a lot of things that influence culture from a structure perspective, uh, as well as from an incentive perspective. Uh, you know, look no further than Wells Fargo and the sales, uh, you know, issues they had a, a few years ago where the sales incentives were causing unethical behavior, which was ignored or condoned, you know, inside the organization. So it, there was a structural component that started that, but then a cultural aspect that allowed that to continue. And when I, you know, if we go back to my comments on boards, that's what boards are worried about. Boards are worried about, is there some underlying cultural issues that will cause us, you know, big risk going forward that maybe we're not aware of. And so they're asking for more measures around that. They're also asking, you know, to make sure that they understand, do we have the culture that's going to be able to grow going forward, no matter where we're trying to expand or grow? Uh, do, are, do we have the right, you know, uh, thoughts around talent and available uh, sources of talent, et cetera? So that's, you're going to see a lot more uh, inquiries around it. But yeah, I'd welcome that conversation, Roger, if you want to Yeah, well, out. maybe uh, maybe a repeat visit and uh, we can have a really good discussion. But I I think that uh, probably uh, you and Safi would end up agreeing on a lot more than uh, you would disagree about because uh, you know, it's it's question like, well, okay, is the um, reward system, uh, is that culture, is it structure? And you know, it, it gets kind of fuzzy at some point. Uh, yeah. uh, so um one kind of random thing I noticed was uh, a comment about team and family. Like a lot of companies would like to say, well, we're, uh, you know, one big family, we're all on the same team. Uh, but uh, there's kind of a little negative on that in the book. Does it describe why maybe team and family is not the uh, optimal way to define your culture? Uh, you know, I, I go back and forth on this a little bit. I, in this, you may have picked up on the family comment uh, when I was talking about uh, BDA and, and uh, the CEO there, Jay Deutsch, who happens to be one of my best friends. And it's interesting because it's a smaller company, you know, around a thousand people, uh, but they use that term family a lot. Uh, they've had me out speaking uh, at a couple different events, and I've always been a little surprised at how often they refer to themselves as a family and talk about family. And they've put in some, you know, different components around that. I guess you know where family sometimes gets a bad rap in in organizations is that it it's not truly a family, right? Uh, we can, you know, we 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 hire and fire, and so it's a little bit different than uh, you know what the way families operate. But you know, team dynamics are so critical, Roger, as you know. Um, and you know, if we go back to Amazon, one of Amazon's uh, reasons for success is because they give so much autonomy to teams maybe almost to a fault at times, because they tend, you know, sometimes they have teams that are duplicative inside the organization. Uh, but teams are, are really um, set up to be nimble and agile. And so even in such a large organization, it's really a, just a, a, you know, a combination of all these tiny little agile teams that have very distinct goals and um, operate like a small little company. Uh, which I find fascinating. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of lot of uh, different aspects to team and family overall inside of companies. Right, and uh, I don't know if they still follow the two pizza uh, rule for teams, but uh, that's uh, a way of keeping them small and from uh, growing into yeah. more of an extended family, perhaps that uh, might be dysfunctional. Right. Yeah. So, what about smaller? I mean, obviously, a lot of your work is with large companies, but I'm curious. Uh, uh, what advice uh, you might have, Kevin, for entrepreneurs or uh, smaller businesses that are trying to form a culture uh, that maybe have that ability? Like it's it's one thing to renovate a culture where you've got this uh, sort of you know high bound big corporation that's been doing things the same way for years and years, uh, and that's certainly a challenge. But um, uh, if you have the ability, either as maybe a unit in a big company that has a lot of autonomy, or as part of uh, a smaller venture, a newer venture. Uh, how how would you suggest uh, starting to build that culture? Yeah, well, pay attention to it would be my my overall uh, suggestion. And I'm one of those entrepreneurs, you know, uh, that has had small companies and you know has had to pay attention to culture uh, over time. It's it sometimes gets uh, pushed to the to the back because entrepreneurs are mostly focused on sales, you know, and and bringing in business. Um, oftentimes, when it comes to people, the, all the focus is on hiring if you're growing a company, and they tend to forget to put in some other aspects around human capital, uh, you know, in favor of, of recruiting, in favor of talent acquisition. Uh, so my biggest advice would be to think about the kind of cultural 
uh, norms that you're setting out. I would establish a purpose very early. Uh, and I talk in the book about purpose statements and how to create them and, uh, and what some good ones look like. Uh, also create values that you want to make sure the company follows and continue to have the, that purpose and those values guide decisions inside the company. That, that would be one of the first things I'd do and make sure that uh, you know, everybody is behaving or, and, and particularly leaders are behaving in line with purpose and values. Because it's one thing to put words in a PowerPoint, it's another, thing's to, another thing to walk the talk and generally employees will do what leadership condones. Uh, but mostly it's, uh, you know, setting the precedent for culture and thinking, you know, I always, I'm a big believer in precedent because uh, it, it, it always kind of comes back to bite me. But when I make exceptions, you know, or do something that's outside the norm, you know, suddenly you're setting a precedent and then that's going to get thrown at you later on. So, you know, always think about the precedent that you're setting inside the organization and stay true to those purpose and values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to imagine that, uh, uh, by simply paying attention to culture and being intentional from the start, you can avoid a lot of the missteps where you get partway down the road and realize that your culture isn't good. If you've got that uh, statement of purpose, that mission statement, and a real one, not just uh, you know one of these uh, corporate boilerplate things, but something that you know really is the story that defines your company, uh, that can help you when you're recruiting people. You won't recruit the wrong people. Uh, it'll help guide their actions when you're not there to look over them. So it uh, all, all makes a lot of sense. Well, I really enjoyed the book, Kevin. How can people find you and your ideas online? So we have a, a separate website for the book. It's culturerenovation.com. And uh, you'll find not only information about the book there, uh, but we've also created some tools, uh, you know, some assessments, dashboards that will help uh, organizations with their culture going forward. We also have a number of case studies out at the site. And we say in the book and we say on the site, even though we've come up with a, a blueprint that many have called the definitive blueprint on how you change culture and 18 action steps, there are things that organizations are doing that are really moving the needle when it comes to culture that aren't in those 18 steps. And we know that because we couldn't fit them all in the book. Uh, so we want to hear from some companies that uh, you know, have come up with unique ideas and unique uh, tactics that they think are working. Uh, we've got a little area on the website where you can put that in. And uh, we want to you know, keep the conversation alive. You know, books, books tend to have a shelf life. And uh, we'd like to you know, have this conversation be an ongoing one because culture change is never done. You never declare we've you know we're, we've changed the culture now let's move on to something else you know culture change is something you've got to continue to work on. Seems like most things in business are that way, Kevin. Uh, you can't just give something attention for a period of time and say, "Well, that's done," and forget about it. Uh, right. uh, so great. Well, we will link uh, to there and to any other resources we spoke about. Uh, on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. Uh, and we'll have audio, video, and text versions of this conversation there as well. Kevin, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Roger. Really appreciate it.